Uh, so different kinds of games you know, can do different things, right? Like I think chess is a very good one for teaching adversity and consequences. And well, if you're going to play a game and you make a bad move, you have to just suffer through it. But at the same time, you also have to learn to not give up, right? Chess is a very, very good game for that regard because there are many situations of where one, one wrong move by the person who's winning and they're no longer winning. You know, I was winning the whole game, but I didn't win. I love the fact that we have these conversations because when you're, when you have a practice, something that you've been doing for so long, uh, that your frame will of mind, the way that you think and the model that you're building of the, of the world, uh, will change. And so we were just talking about some of the old game projects and studios and things like that that were happening. And we were talking about, uh, battle Royale and that, that game site. So that's Fortnite. And we were talking about this other game that was just positioned there. And you said a comment to me like, hey, because of the product market fit, because of the timing of the release, that a game was considered a battle royale game, even though it really wasn't. And my mind as a game designer immediately went to like, huh, some minor tweaks could have made that really compelling. <laughs> Most likely, yes. 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 Yeah. Just, there's something to differentiate it, right? Yeah, 100%. 100%. So... Um, my friend Derek, the surface of a sphere with an infinite radius is flat. This is the quote that you shared with me off air. What does it mean to you? It's a funny quote in that it's not something people would normally think about. And I like these sort of things because I think like exercising the mind and thinking about things in extreme or unexpected ways is both like productive and also just interesting. It, it, and so it's less about like this particular quote and the fact that it's like sort of emblematic of that mindset of like trying to think outside the box and not within your own personal experiences and trying to think of like, what are some other perspectives on the world? And in this case, it's a very extreme perspective of like, imagine, you know, that maybe the universe is ever expanding. So it functionally has an infinite radius. So if you were to somehow be able to observe the universe from outside the frame of reference of the universe, what would that actually look like? Is it actually flat? And then of course you get into funny discussion about like flat earth and stuff. <laughs> That's interesting. I like that. I, I, I can totally understand the, um, for the, for most of the feel good fathers about getting outside of yourself and, and seeing and taking on the perspective of other people. But I think from the perspective of, of reality, of getting outside the universe, you know, I was listening to Elon Musk recently talking about the simulation and, and usually my default position in, in that world is simply to say, well, it's kind of like the argument of determinism versus free will in that, does it fundamentally change your experience day to day? Does it, does that, does that thing do that? Uh, does that question, does that topic, does that philosophy does that end point that you've, you've come to, does it change that? Does it change the way that you interact with the, uh, the people you interact with, the way you think about yourself, stuff like that? However, this idea is something I hadn't really considered this, this concept. Where did this come from? What, what book? Uh, it's from an, uh, I, I don't precisely remember which book, but it's the Ender series by uh, Orson Scott Card. Oh. It, it's one of the books. I don't remember precisely which one. And exceptionally topical given, given, uh, you and I were both game designers that the core, the core structure of that world is built in a video game simulation that turns out not to be a video game simulation. Um, that and, involves children and children. That's right. Uh, so what is, what does that series mean to you? Like what, what can we talk about here? Hmm. So for me, my favorite book in that series is actually not the first one where the video game situation resides, um, but it's the second one, I believe, called Speaker for the Dead. And that particular book revolves around the idea of telling the truth about a person's life and their experiences and not sort of sugarcoating it just because they're dead. And how telling the truth review stuff about ourselves and each other and the relationships we had in 
in sometimes painful ways, but enlightening and revealing ones. And, you know, pretending that things don't exist or trying to ignore the reality of things just for the sake of appearances uh, can often backfire and leave you worse off than you would have been if you had just faced the consequences. This is the entire thematic story of, you know, let's, let's ground it in, in a more pop movie like Gladiator, right? Russell Crowe's Gladiator, this whole idea that like, that let's distract them with the games. Let's distract them with the gladiatory games. They're hungry. Mm -hmm. We're poor. The empire is in decline. Uh, this is the Mary Antoinette, let them eat cake. You know, you're hungry, but it's okay. You can have some cake. You know, this, this whole idea of, well, why not approach it head on? Why not involve, um, involve people in the discussion? And I'm, and I think a lot of, from our background, I remember, God, it would have been one of the collapses. I think, Oh, eight, I think it was. And Bioware, the founders of Bioware down in Austin went in front of the company and did the full revenue breakdown of the studio. And they're like, this is, this is the reality of where we are. And so in that enrollment of, um, usually when you think of the industry, you're thinking of layoffs, right? There's the great games, the great entertainment pieces that we're creating, but there's also the layoffs and the business of being in the games that, um, they're usually quick traumatizing and, uh, painful to say the least, but that yeah. transparency of, of what you're talking about here of that, let's call the spade what it is. Let's, let's go ahead and, um, enroll everybody in the vision of where we're going and what we need to create. And that's something that a lot of modern businesses end up taking on. And, um, especially when you're into the entrepreneur space, it's, uh, at the lower end of the entrepreneur space, you usually like pre seven, pre eight figures you're kind of in that world where your team is much smaller, just a little bit more transparency. Yeah. And th that's the situation where it's much more important to have the buy-in and stuff, you know, from the people that who's going to be big building your company and your team. Right? Like, yeah, exactly. If you can't trust them, who can you trust really? <laughs> yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent. So what have you, um, so where are you right now? What are you doing? And um, let's, let's get caught up real quick. Yeah, I mean, we could start from almost anyway, but currently I'm the uh, design director at Temple Games. Um, that's awesome. So how did you, um, as a father in the industry, right, what is your, what's your perspective on gaming at large and, um, and fatherhood? Yeah, so I think you and I are both aware of like the stigma and, and stuff around games. And, you know, you know, I even joke with my wife, who's a teacher, that you know, I make the kids unproductive and she makes them productive. But that's really tongue in cheek, and I don't truly believe that. Um, I think there are certainly negatives to games and negative with almost anything, any hobby, any vice, or, or whatever you want to call them. You know, you can get into a state of where you're so into something that you don't have experiences or life outside of that, and and that's always dangerous, no matter what it is. Um, of course. You know, if you truly succeed at something like that, you know, in some cases, you, you become very successful as well. Um, but even like professional athletes and stuff can often have very sort of stunted development in other areas of life, right? Because there's have been so hyper focused on this one particular thing that makes them successful, uh, but is not without its drawbacks. Um, but I think games in general ha is a very strong learning opportunity, uh, particularly for kids. You know, if you think about, you know, as you know, fathers to young children, the way they learn is through play, right? And the way that you get them to engage in learning often is to do it through play. And play can often turn chores and things that are work into something more fun and a learning experience. So, you know, one thing I did when my kids are small is like we had these colored balls, right? That they would throw everywhere. You, know, you put them in a bin and they dump them all out immediately as soon as they wake up. That's the thing they want to do. Uh, there's a very tactile experience there. And, and, and it makes sense. You know, they're two, they're three years old. They just want to dump it and see the sounds and the sights of the throwing. But then someone has to pick them up. And you can try and force them to do it, you know, but you can also make it a game. So I, you know, got some cardboard boxes and I, you know, put, put some color on them. This one is where the yellow balls go. This one's where the orange balls go. This one's where the blue balls go. And I had two kids and I'm like, Go for it. See who can put more of the right color bins, uh, balls into the right bins. And that worked for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That, uh, you know, that 
that competition, the, the see who can do that. I love it. And, um, there's so many, there are, I think there are so many opportunities where we want to, it's interesting here because the term I want to use is fun, but that's not really what's critical in this moment. It's, there's a lot of new study going into like neuroscience of attention and stuff like that, that it really has nothing to do with just attention, distraction or focus because, um, you know, take anybody that, that any, any young person that can play a game for four hours and like focus is not their issue. Right. But it becomes interest. It becomes the, the, the actual currency that we're trading for is like, do you have something that's interesting? And I used to always say, it's like, um, when I was in college, there was a real stigma about being a game, a game player. So MMOs were kind of in their infancy. Uh, this is pre world of Warcraft to give you an idea. And, um, there was a huge stigma at that time. Like it wasn't, you weren't a geek in geek culture, which is fun. You were a nerd right? and you were this <laughs> isolated geeky person. And, um, but I remember being in college and saying like, okay, well, the world wants me to go get drunk, go out into the world, do pickup, be a hooligan, engage in hazing and all this other kind of stuff. And all that is down across the board. And it's, but instead what I would rather do is like grab a pizza with my buddies and, and play these games here and build our local community, which is something that, I mean, it's been 20 years. So, uh, since that time in my life and today we have major issues now where we're not, where most people aren't able to connect to each other. Are there any games or, uh, that you play with your kids that, uh, that you enjoy playing with them that is part of like their development or you're trying to teach them something, something greater? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm really looking forward to when they can play more complex games, but I think games of almost any shape or size can be provided learning opportunity. And it's part of being a parent to identify those opportunities and to leverage those when they come up. Um, you know, education, you know, whether it's through games or traditional education is fundamentally more about parental involvement and like personal involvement, you know, wh whether it's yourself, you know, in grade five, grade six, middle school, or you're in college, if you don't apply yourself, it's not going to work. Um, and when you're the parent of a young child, that's your job because they don't know that. And, and that they have limited resources and knowledge to, to pull that off. Um, so even stuff like Candyland, which is fundamentally, I don't know, a pretty bland game, teaches them colors and following the rules and taking turns. So as long as you put in some of your mind share into thinking about what are the skills that are being taught in this particular exercise or game, um, I think almost anything can be a learning opportunity. Right now we fill out a Mario Kart. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have a six-year-old and a five-year-old. The six-year-old does quite well. Uh, the five-year-old does not. And initially, she was getting very frustrated about not being able to win. Um, but as we continue to playing, now she's starting to be okay with losing and still having fun. And so that's a learning moment, right? Like you can still have fun even if you don't get, you know, on the podium. I think the, the really critical part that you're highlighting for the feel-good fathers that are listening here is that you're actively involved. You're not handing them a phone. You're not giving them a remote. You're not giving them a controller and saying, go distract yourself. You're engaged in the activity with them. And that's something that I did as well. Uh, so for us, like the longest running game that we played together was Terraria. And when we first started Terraria, it was really like, get some blocks, hold down the button. And then just like with auto build, it would just fill her, uh, fill her screen, which is like the blocks. So what's Terraria? Terraria is a 2D Minecraft esque game, which basically means you can pick up a block and you can place a block. And then that's sort of the, and there's like some action elements in there, like a Mario. So jumping and swinging, swinging a weapon and that kind of jazz. So at its, at its core elements, that's what the game is. So there's creativity and creating a world and, placing decorations and so and over time motor skills and motor skills and she she eventually got to the point where now she's like designing designing the rooms that she wants and we're finding different materials and and so there's this whole expression thing and that led into doing that in a 3d world so we played portal lights together and then we played minecraft together and it's just about what are the things that we can create what are the experience so she would that, that she can create so she would create zoos and, and malls and shopping centers and stuff like that. And just 
and then she would like show it off to to me and show it off to to my wife and and just kind of do that and so um games itself aren't you know they're what we make of them they can either be a tool of distraction or they can be uh, as you're saying a learning moment or a community builder yeah it's particularly true of like the sandbox type games that you know like minecraft or where different people can play them in different ways like if you want to build a zoo in it you can and that could be very different than how someone else plays it and you learn logistics you learn programming you you know there's lots of things that are in these games you know you mentioned mmos earlier and you know mmos had a very big stigma about them but if you really dig into them you know it's it's a way for people to be social mm-hmm. you know and if you do certain things in it you're learning leadership skills and conflict mediation and stuff i ran a 200 person guild and learned a lot there about people management and you know leveraging different strengths and weaknesses and you know that's also you know part of being a good life partner is you know recognizing your own strength and weaknesses and leveraging those that of your partner i think that's awesome because you said you're the you're the distraction creator and she's the productivity creator as the teacher um anything that you have to say for feel good fathers on on that topic on on uh designing a good partnership with your with your life partner Yeah, so I think the most important part is to recognize that it is a partnership, right? And and that, you know, you signed up for this partnership and it's a team. You know, you know when we're building games, we have a team and different people are strength and weaknesses and we need to cover each other, you know, and leverage this the strengths of the team as a whole, you know. And if there's something that I really hate doing that or really bad at, then, you know, my wife does it. If there's something that she doesn't want to do or, you know, I'm more appropriately suited for, I do it. Uh, in our case, we're pretty non-traditional in, in the division of labor. She does most of the outside, sort of like traditionally what the man would do. Uh, she takes care of the cars. Uh, we full-time RV for a year. She maintains the RV. She drives the truck. I have not towed it once. It's a 36-foot RV plus like the truck. So it, it's a big beast. You know, We're talking like 20,000 pounds of stuff that she's hauling. Um, I have not done it once. <laughs> Um, so I do most of the home stuff, you know, like cooking and stuff or used to, now that I took this full-time job, she's doing a lot of the cooking now. Um, so the other part there is like adaptability, right? It just, because I was doing, it doesn't mean I'm doing it for the rest of time. It means that as circumstances change, we reevaluate and we think about things and we reevaluate the needs of each other. You know, if, if her shoulder is hurting for whatever reason, because she hurt it, then I take over certain things that, you know, she can't, she's not able to do now. So happy marriage and you know uh example for the kids and all this stuff you know involves continuous to communicating and not sort of being stuck in you know the status quo i love uh what you were saying there was growth uh one of the core themes so there a lot a lot happened there responsibility your commitment to your word uh but growth was a was a core element there um, and one of the elements of feel good fatherhood is this idea that there's this continual kaizen, continual self improvement. Uh, as you get better as a father, your family gets better as a unit, the neighborhood gets better, et cetera, et cetera, out um, as it goes. Um, chat a little bit a bit about it because when we worked together, right, we we had uh, we were more peers, right, and then you've kind of climbed up and you've you've adjusted. I'd love to hear your journey of this growth. Uh, professionally, and then let's tie it as well to maybe some other pieces in in the family, your your personal growth there. Yeah, so when we worked together, it was a comp- it was a startup that we both joined, um, and like a lot of startups, it ended up you know falling apart at some point um, for various reasons. We don't have to get into it. Um, and there was a moment of like, is this what I should be doing, right? Re- reevaluating it. I just bought a house, you know, I was making good money at that company and now I can't afford the house. Right. And it's like, is this instability what I want for my family? Um, so my choice there was to try to do something where I had more control. So I started doing freelance consulting. I started hitting up my contacts, be like, what can I do for you? And, and trying to build my own brand. Um, so I worked with various companies at various times, I ended up going to India for a couple months and, and building out uh, a design team over there for a company. Um, but ultimately that was also still un- unstable. <laughs> you know, um, and I started exploring other side gigs and stuff. In the meantime, my wife completed her teacher's certificate and 
started teaching and I shifted more to being the stay-at-home dad. Um, eventually though, uh, more game design opportunities returned uh, and now I'm in this role. So it's, it, it's one of those things of where you just have to sort of roll the punches and be adaptable and make the best of what you have and, you know, and being open to opportunities. There's a, there was this experiment that people did of, of people who felt like they were lucky and people who didn't feel they were lucky. And it's turned out that at least in, in, in this experiment that people who felt lucky were actually just more observant. The, the experiment consisted of telling people to sit down and read a newspaper, and then they were to answer some questions about what they saw on the paper. Um, and there was an ad, a fake ad, put into the paper that said, if you read this, you get $100. Just let us know. And the people who felt they were lucky paid attention and saw the ad. And the people that you know, consider themselves unlucky in life would just not see it. That's so fascinating. Like, you know, there's that saying, like, you know, one door closes, another one opens. And I think that's absolutely true. There's always more opportunities out there. But you have to have your eyes open. And you have to be willing to take the opportunities that's presented, even if they may not have been the ones you wanted. Right time, right place, right person. Totally get it. Do you have any um, tips or do you have any opinion on how to cultivate this? And less so in, in yourself. You know, the feel good father, if you're listening here, you're, you're a pretty self-observant person. You're pretty much into personal growth. Uh, how, do, how would you cultivate this in your kids, this awareness? Honestly, probably for games, <laughs> right? Like that, that, that's, that's my wheelhouse, right? Um, so I think a lot of this is just about exposing them to like new ideas, new opportunities, so that they're not sort of stuck on the mindset of, I'm a girl, so I do this. I'm a boy, so I do this. Or I'm Asian, so I'm good at this, right? Part of the reason we did the full-time RV thing for a while is to expose them to lots of new ideas. And, and new people and, and new things. Uh, it's interesting because you know we also homeschool as as part of you know doing all that, and um, we meet a lot of homeschool parents. And you know in that community, there's a lot of skepticism about traditional schooling, which some of it I agree with, but not all of it. And one particular thing that comes up a lot is the, the idea of like, do you really want your kids to be uh, exposed to people with such different values? Because a lot of homeschoolers tend to be very Christian and conservative. Whereas like school tends to be a little bit more liberal. So there's that conflict. And for me, when, you know, somebody said that to me, immediately I was like, of course, yeah. like that's yeah. the entire point of this, right? If I put them in a school and they're there for hours and hours at a time, they're going to be very limited in their experience and, and, and the exposure of, of what they have uh, if I don't take them out of that environment. Uh, and that's not to say that you can't do that. You know, obviously it depends on, you know, how you do it outside of the school time. Um, but for us, we had the opportunity to actually take them out of school and travel to the U S travel and, and expose them hands on, see different cultures, see different places. And we took advantage of that, you know, that we had that opportunity at that point in our lives. I think a lot about what are the core, given everything you were saying, like, what are the core skills that you can learn from your experience with games, overcoming <laughs> failure? Um, yeah, so different kinds game. of games you know, right. can, can do different things, right? Like I think chess is a very good one for teaching adversity mm -hmm. and consequences. And well, if you're going to play a game and you make a bad move, you have to just suffer through it. But at the same time, you also have to learn to not give up, right? Yes. Chess is a very, very good game for that regard because there are many situations of where one, one wrong move by the person who's winning and they're no longer winning. You know, right. I was winning the whole game, but I didn't win. And on that flip side of that, like if you're the person who has been either earned advantages because you played well, or you were given those advantages because of your parents and, and, and your upbringing, you still have to finish it. You still have to get to the finish line. You can't just be like, I'm winning. So I'm just going to coast, right? You know, you need to you know, take that advantage and leverage it and, and get to the finish line. Then you have other games like grand strategy games that teach you macro level thinking about like, the high level strategy of things and resource management. Uh, you talk to uh, Jack who, you know, was talking about like investment and finances and 
I think games can teach a lot of that in Russo Magic, even if it's not directly money related. The idea of like short term thinking and long term thinking, and you know, most of those games, you know, if you want to play them well, ask you to invest in the economy of what you're doing before you, you know, leverage that economic engine to do the thing you actually wanted to do. So always, you know, the, the, the payoff is delayed. <laughs> I always think of civilization in this world where it's like in some of the, in the, and I joke that with Civ 1, because I played that growing up, it was really about learning about world history and the different cultures and, and what they were doing. And that was mm -hmm. part of the reason for it. But in later ones is exactly what you're talking about. It was, all right, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to play a 20 to 40 hour strategy where I'm picking this style of play. I'm, ex I'm, I'm investing this style of play. I'm going to go through to the end in, in my experience. And I'm going to do another one, a different, like different civilization, different tactics, different strategy, different economic deployments, stuff like that. Um, that's awesome. Um, so you mentioned chess for the first one for your, what other strategy games, like any specific titles that you think would be really good, um, to share. Yeah. Chess is a nice one, I think for like fathers in, in particular, because it's one that has simple rules and it's a physical game. So a lot of the other games that you and I would know are, are, are digital games and maybe require a little more investment. Sure. Whereas, you know, chess is a game that you can just bring out uh, and it, it's more accessible in, in many ways um, and takes, you know, the kids away from the screens and stuff and, you know, and you can take it on a camping trip or whatever. So how about other board games? Anything else that you, you did that any, any games you played with your kids while they were on the road that were really fun? Um, unfortunately, they're just a little too young, you know, when yeah. we were doing that to like really get into uh, a lot of board games. But uh, there's one that they really like called um, I actually don't know what it's called, but it, it's a it's a ladybug game where you have to collect aphids in order to get past the ants and get to the finish line. Um, and you know, that one has a little bit more complex rules than Candyland. You know, you know, there are skip turns. There are things that make you go again. And if you don't have enough aphids, you have to take this loop back and then come back around and, and basically um, like bide your time and, and, and figure out what you actually need in order to get past this hurdle. That's solid. That's, that's a solid skill for, for that age group. How about for a father? What should a father play? <laughs> what do you think a father should play? Um, I mean, I think the most important part is that it's something that you find interesting, that, that you know, there, there's something for you, right? Um, I think when it comes to like being a father often, or being a parent in general, really, it's that you may not have much time to yourself. Mm -hmm. And there's a constant demand for your attention and such. Um, and, and so, you know, lately, unfortunately, I've not had time to play too many games that are like more deeper. So I tend to favor games that are more bite-sized that I can still get a little bit of um, downtime for myself. Like I play games to relax. I play games to say, hey, this is this is daddy's space. This is daddy's time. Uh, and we teach our kids that too. Like, you know, if they're getting overwhelmed, if, you know, things are not, you know, if they're not happy with whatever's happening, they have their own space that they can go to in order to have that downtime and just, you know, be by themselves and, and not have to deal with, you know, whatever conflicts that are happening, uh, mm -hmm. you know, with the, with the siblings or with the, with the other parents. That's interesting. So if I was thinking about when my daughter was young, so around that age, I definitely say that as a pre feel good father, I wanted to be, I wanted to be the Rams, the Ram trying to knock down the door. I wanted to solve the issue. I wanted to have that, that Fiero. I was like, oh, there's a, a fight or an argument, you know, when I, when I had more of an edge that I wanted to get through. But I think teaching your kids that like, hey, you've got this space. There's a space here that you can go to where it's safe, where you can reflect and pause and gather yourself. I think that's, that's super valuable. That's super valuable. Yeah, like... You know, I don't know if this is a problem with like evolution, but like they get big emotions for their size and it's hard to handle. Like even as adults, we have trouble with that and I have trouble with that. Um, and, you know, and part of this is also just like not shying away from showing them your own faults and your own mistakes, right? Like, you know, if I get angry and I throw something or whatever, 
we don't pretend it didn't happen, right? It happened when you talk about it and they need to understand that, you know, it wasn't directed at them. This is not something you should do, but explain what happened and why. I recently read that actually those, the big emotions for their size is actually a, um, it's an evolutionary function. So the kid that gets, that has the bigger emotion has the larger desire for whatever it is, gets the resource. And mm -hmm. the kid that keeps getting the resource is the one that ends up thriving. And I think it's really interesting because when they're young, it's an immediate, like it's a survival thing, right? It's just kind of like, oh, I'm competing with all the other kids in my tribe to, to do it, even if it's just the two of them in the house. But then right. uh, as they get older, I think there's an interesting switch where usually right around high school, we're saying, okay, no more big emotions. <laughs> like you've had this, You've had this one strategy since you were born, basically, of being big, being loud, being... Not, I wouldn't say obnoxious, but I can't think of another another word here for that to get the resource. And then assertive. We, yeah, <laughs> there we go. Assertive. Thank you, Derek. Uh, um, that then we then say, okay, now you've got to get that collaboration. And we've talked about MMOs. We talked about all that other other kind of things as well. There is that stage where they need to learn how to work together, both competitively. It's very easy to teach competitive stuff. You know, I think of Uno, like the whole time we were talking about, like. Uh, my daughter loves two games. One is uh, Monopoly and, and in fact, a feel good father, not necessarily, we did start on Monopoly one, like the traditional, but the, uh, the last airbender Monopoly version has each of the characters has like, they have skills that can activate during play, which is super fun. And they simplify the economy side of it. So it makes it mm -hmm. much more reasonable for uh, younger kids. Everything is either gold or silver tokens. So gold tokens is five and the silver is one and that's it. And like, that's all the economy. And so nothing really gets above like 20 or 30. So they can count, they can understand yeah. the exchange. It's like, it's a, whoever, whoever you are game designer that made that version of Monopoly, like well done, just, just well done. It's yeah. Good. I'm not a fan of traditional Monopoly for many reasons. And, and that's one of them, right? Like it, it's, you kind of need a calculator. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you do. Yeah. Sometimes you do. Um, well, that's fantastic and uh, really solid. You have some other elements here in your sort of in your experience of of becoming a, a feel good father. So, do you want to discuss those? Sure. Yeah, I think we can talk maybe a little bit about you know why we did the full time RV and and what that experience is like because that might be a unique experience amongst the people that you know you've been talking to. Um, so you know. It's not an opportunity that comes up for everybody, obviously. You know, we were financially stable enough that we could, you know, buy the RV and just be like, we're getting out of here. We're just going to live on the road for a year. Um, but it's part of like making that difficult choice. And, you know, we were able to do it, but it wasn't easy either, right? Like, you know, we understood that that would probably set us back a little bit financially. And, but we decided that was going to be worth doing. Um, and the reason we did it was primarily to give the kids experience that they wouldn't otherwise have gotten. Um, and a couple of things we learned while doing that. Um, one is that you actually can have a lot of experience where you actually are. You know, wherever we traveled, we would be able to find interesting things to do, even if you know it wasn't a destination spot. Um, and I think you know when you live somewhere for a long time and that's your home, you sort of lose the exploration side of that place. And you're just going to go to the same spots. You're like, this is where we go for dinner. This is where we go when the kids want to go to the park. Um, but, you know, even with parks, you know, if you live in a big enough city, there's probably dozens of parks you've never been to. You know, take your kids to a different park. Make make it a mission to, like, see as many parks in, in, the, in the area that you live as possible. Um, just drive down some random roads, see if there are interesting things to see. Um, so, you know, that, that that's one thing I learned is that, you know, wherever you go, there's probably something interesting you could be doing with your kids or, you know, even if you don't have kids. Um, but, you know, when you live somewhere, you, the blinders come on and you're just like, this, this is just my home. And this is not somewhere where we can have fun. One of the consistent, when, whenever I'm talking about games, especially when it comes to, to young boys and, and to parents that have kids that are playing games, I, I always talk about this diversity of experience, which is what, what you just mentioned to us. And that, you know, if you're a, if you're a young boy like I was, I was skinny, I was small for my age, a little bit awkward, 
I didn't really come into my own till the end of high school, really until college. Um, kids are cruel. We all know that this <laughs> is real. They're learning. They're socially not great, right? They're they're learning how to be cool to each other and learning how to have that the hierarchies and stuff like that. And who's the popular one? Who's not the popular one? Where do I fit in? That kind of jazz. And um, games in those world can be this escape, this adventure, right? So that's that's one positive use for them. You can uh, I always say like for for young boys who don't have a lot of agency in their life, of course they're going to gravitate towards a game. You know what would mm-hmm. you rather be? The awkward zitty you know, not a football guy or not the traditional jock, not really necessarily very good at school kid who's getting yelled at all the time, or would you rather be the knight with the sword slaying the dragon? I know exactly what I would pick every time, every single time. So, uh, but in that concrete world of just don't get into the rut, give yourself a variety of experiences. um, I think thematically, that's a great, I don't know if you thought about this, but it's a great theme for your life where you were like, yeah, I want my kids to be exposed to a whole bunch of different ideas. I want to go out and experience a whole bunch of different games. I want to go to different parks. I want to do all these different things. I want to RV for a year. Uh, that's wonderful. How would you, what would you say to a feel good father to sort of cultivate adventure? Let's say adventure. Yeah. So I think, you know, since becoming a father, I've, you know, I still don't do improv, but I think the improv of like, yes. And, you know, did they use that phrase of like, if somebody's offering you an opportunity or if somebody wants to do something and improv is like, you know, if I'm doing something, you try and support whatever the other person is doing and, and build upon it as opposed to be trying to like shoot it down or think of ways that it doesn't work. Um, I think that also works in game design um, and, and, and other areas of your life. It's just like, you know, if your kid wants to explore something, can you, can you make it happen for them? Right. Um, you know, if they're interested in something and like often, you know, they, they ask lots of questions. They want to learn about the world. Like maybe it's an evolutionary thing again, where it's like, they're just constantly asking questions. Like, even if they don't need to know, they want to know. Um, and you can often take those and just really expand it out, right? Like you can, you can answer them and be done with it, or you can demonstrate it empirically. You know, you can do an experiment. You can, you know, if you can't go somewhere to show it to them, you can open your tablet and pull up a video. You know, one of my kids was really interested in tornadoes the other day. So we watched some videos on tornadoes and how they form and whatever else. You know, I don't have the expertise there, but the technology allows me to leverage it and be able to show them things that they can't. One of the other guests, uh, you and him are talking about VR. Um, and I think that's an option there as well of where I'm never going to climb, you know, Mount Himalaya. Like that's not a thing I'm ever going to be doing. But I can do that in VR. <laughs> I can have those experiences. Uh, another great use for ERA is to explore like, different cultures and different places that you can't physically get to. Uh, you can load up Google Earth and just jump right in and start yeah. walking the streets of Hanoi. You can go to Tokyo um, and just immerse yourself in experiences. And you know, when it comes to games, uh, you know, like escape rooms are super fun and interesting to do. You know, I don't know if you've ever done one, but um, you know. But they have sort of like physical limitations of like cost and repeatability. Uh, but in VR, the experience can be much more immersive and much more diverse. And you know, when you complete a puzzle, the roof of the building can literally collapse around you, or the season can change, and, and that kind of stuff that would be prohibitively expensive uh, to pull off in, in real life. So, um, yeah, those technologies I think are going to come into their own here. You know, hopefully in our lifetime, because there, there are things that I want to experience. Hundred percent. I I was just thinking about uh, the new generative AI models like ChatGPT, MidJourney, and for those of you listening from the future, I'm sorry if those are the old ones, <laughs> <laughs> right? But OpenAI, right? For today, these are the ones. Yep. And um, I I keep thinking about my first real MMOs, my first real games were really actually I should say more my first real game dev experience was I did LPC muds way back in the day. So it's a, it's a C-based programming language. It was called LPC and I would create worlds. Like it's all text-based. And now we have these tools where I think it was like day one, there was one uh, game dev influencer. I can't even think of his name, but he made, he basically made a text-based adventure game in chat GPT on day one, which was awesome, which was really cool. Uh, where do you like, let's, let's futurist for just a minute. Like, where do you think the uh, the inclusion of some of these generative AI models is going to be in game dev? Hmm. 
So right now, I know that a lot of people are using it to do like sort of like mundane tasks, like writing a script to like rename stuff or or doing other things that you know. The AIs might not do them very efficiently, but you don't need them to, right? These are things that you might run one time. Uh, you can clean up a little bit to to get them to do precisely what you want. Um, so I think that, that that's an area that's going to continue to improve. Um, I also think that. There is some, some some movement in the area of using it in terms of like uh, like dungeon mastering of like mm -hmm. building out narrative worlds um, in in ways that are like when you have to write everything you know as humans it's kind of limited you know when your player so we're talking about things like Dungeons and Dragons and, and other tabletop role playing games where you have uh, somebody called the dungeon master and they are the ones like running the game so they have like a script that they have created for like what the players are supposed to be doing. But one of the things players love to do is go off script. And then you have to have the ad lib it. Um, and humans have some capacity to do this, but you know, I think AI might be very helpful in that regard. And there are tools that people have made to help with that as well. Um, cards and stuff that you can just, you know, shuffle and be like, okay, I don't know what to do now. Players are doing this whole other thing that's, you know, I didn't prepare for what monsters would they see? You can just, you know, take a card out. Um, but the AI is going to have the ability to keep it much more in-world and the narrative and build upon what you have already built and be able to spit out something very quickly that still fits within the themes of what you're trying to do. I, th I think it would be a really interesting world to have a, a companion. Uh, like mm -hmm. I think of like um, Google or Alexa or something like that, like a companion device that has these capabilities built into it that has the frameworks of whatever game system you're using where you can sit around with your buddies and offload the the game and the world creation to another entity and just have it interact in a certain way uh where you can just sit around and play uh one of the one of the core issues with with this structure in the world is that um it's usually like 10x the work to create the game world to be the dungeon master than it is to actually play and it's exhausting yeah. and, and a lot of people burn out by doing it um but i think that would be a really interesting future at least as far as like a i don't know two or three year step from here to there right uh that's something that we can definitely see um well awesome so uh if folks derek if folk wants to to connect with you or or see what you're up to where can they reach you um, so I don't really do social media very much, uh, but I have LinkedIn, so they can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, just my name, Derek Chin. Although I think there are a bunch of Derek Chins on there, so maybe we'll give them a link or something. So, sounds good. And one of the one of the core elements that uh, both Derek and I were talking about offline was if you're a parent sometimes, and um, if you know us, and there's somebody that wants to get into game dev, that generally following other game devs or engaging with them in some sort of conversation can can help. Uh, make those dreams seem closer to reality in the same way that if your kid wants to be an astronaut, maybe meeting an astronaut might, might help them understand what it takes. Yeah. yeah. I think a lot of kids like grow up thinking, Oh, I just play games. And I can pick up game designer or, or a game developer, but you do need other skills and the reality of making games is you're not just sitting around playing games all day. So sometimes the reality check also helps. Awesome. Awesome. Derek Chin, everybody. <laughs>